Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Data Diversity. I want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss graph databases, benefits and risks, sponsored today by Stardog. To the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to know the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And to open the chat or the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to Naveen for a brief word from our sponsor, Stardog. Naveen, hello and welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, want a quick introduction. I'm the VP of product here at Stardog. Stardog is an enterprise knowledge graph platform based out of Arlington, Virginia. Uh, we're a uh, VC-backed company and uh, been in the business for a little over 10 years. Happy to be here. Real quick, I uh, wanted to take some time to talk a little bit about you know, how we think about this market space around enterprise knowledge graphs and our ability to democratize data for analytics and AI workloads. We all know Gartner's uh, continuous, uh, continuously evol evaluating the market landscape. And one of the areas that they've really honed in on is this notion of how to tackle with this growing volume of data and distribution um, across the enterprise, uh, making it very difficult for organizations to exploit their data assets efficiently and effectively. And uh, what they recommend, and, and we certainly uh, we certainly believe that uh, that's, this is a right approach when you're thinking about your own data architecture strategies, is to adopt a semantic approach to your enterprise data. And otherwise, uh, they certainly fully believe, and we, we certainly believe as well, you and the large enterprise organizations will continue to face this endless battle with data silos. And um, when we kind of drill further into what does that really look like, you know, at the at the data architecture level, there's still points of friction that continue to remain when it comes to sharing data and knowledge broadly, right? You think about um, breaking down the data architecture in terms of the culture you're trying to create, the data culture. Uh, the data models that you need to build to in order to serve the enterprise, uh, the integration that is required uh, in order to bring all this data together, the interrogation of that data, and eventually the intelligence uh, with the underlying data and the metadata. And how do you turn, transform uh, what are what I would say are traditional challenges uh, with uh, the current architectures to opportunities? So when we think about data culture, the focus sort of shifts away from big data to wide data. That means you're not necessarily just worrying about collecting data. You're also worrying about connecting data. Uh, and, and you're not just looking at an approach that is purely centralizing all of your data assets, but working in ways that allows you to federate data access. And then more importantly, you're not just leaving this in terms of control with a handful of specialists but broadly working on data sharing to enable citizen data users. And when you think about it from a data model perspective, current, current architectures kind of data models are tightly coupled and shaped by the underlying data storage infrastructure. And, and where the opportunity lies is really in this notion of semantic models, right? The semantic model that is abstracted away from the underlying data structure, which, and then represents itself uh, as business meaning which means it's sort of more consumer driven rather than data, data consumer driven rather than data producer driven. Uh, so you're looking at it from that lens uh, and, and that way you have a business meaning attached to it, which enables at the end of the day, this notion of data harmonization, reuse and interoperability. Uh, when we look at data in integration, it's really in this notion of, well, everything has to be solved by making physical copies uh, of data uh, in, in order to serve the needs of the business, right? So you end up creating these complex data pipelines, <clears throat> either ETL or ELT. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are opportunities here to look at ways to virtualize access to data that limits data sprawl. Yes, we will never ever move away from ETLing, but there are opportunities where you may have to take the right strategy 
when it comes to you know enabling the business for ad hoc data analysis or working with data that's in a source system that requires real time access to that information so you're looking at the fresh freshest data possible and and frankly limiting um, the amount of complex data pipeline development that needs to go on um, the same thing around data interrogation a lot of times data interrogation is sort of centered around this notion of you got to define your queries up front, and those queries are optimized for performance based on the underlying data repository, uh, where really the opportunity is to create this uh, notion of a search-driven data exploration, uh, enabling more complex query processing by citizen data users in the ways that they can self-serve. And lastly, and not but not least, is sort of this notion of data intelligence, right? So what do we know about the data? And oftentimes, again, in traditional architectures, it's sort of this collection of metadata that's cataloged, inventoried for passive analytics, uh, you know, it, and sits on the side with no association to the underlying uh, data itself. And the opportunity is really uh, how do you connect that metadata through that semantic model with the actual data so you can kind of infer new relationships and drive intelligent recommendations. So with that, uh, obviously, we get into this notion of what enables an organization to uh, take advantage of those opportunities. An enterprise knowledge graph is exactly what is needed uh, because at the end of the day, what an enterprise knowledge graph does is it enables this flexible semantic data layer for answering complex queries across a diverse but connected enterprise data landscape. And doing so in the way it does is it of course harmonizes data, metadata and rules with a business information model. It limits data sprawl with federated data access to heterogeneous sources and enable citizen data users to self-serve and participate in, in the data process itself, right? At the end of the day, you want to serve the larger swath of the business users uh, and being able to independently work with data and gain the insights and, and, and drive the decisions they need to make uh, to, to function within their organization, their operation, whatever it may be. And to that extent, uh, Stardog uh, really is about uh, delivering this enterprise knowledge graph platform connecting data based on business meaning and providing this flexible, reusable semantic data layer. And we help customers across many industries. So again, uh, really our goal is to empower data citizens to make knowledge informed decisions. And if you have, uh, if you have uh, an opportunity uh, and the inclination to embark on a journey, uh, whether it's an enterprise knowledge graph uh, or otherwise, we certainly have um, some assets here for you to get started for free. Uh, gives you an, a really hands-on experience in, in, in both in terms of learning, trying, using uh, uh, an enterprise knowledge graph platform for a whole host of use cases that might be of interest. And we have prefabricated knowledge kits uh, by domains, by industries that you may even leverage to, to as a starting point if you don't want to bring your own data. Uh, if you are Databricks users and are inclined to work uh, within that kind of an environment, we also have a, um, an established partnership with Databricks. So within your Databricks environment, you can look up uh, the category called uh, semantic layer, uh, which is Stardog. Uh, and then certainly uh, you can connect to us through your Databricks environment directly as well. I know I kind of rushed through this very fast and I, I, I look forward to the presentation here shortly. And then of course, um, come back and uh, take any questions as we go into the Q&A session. So. With that, I'll turn this over to Donna. I think we made good time and we'll move along accordingly. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for kicking us off. If you have any questions for Naveen, you may submit your questions in the Q&A as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar. Now let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She currently is the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, thanks so much. Always a pleasure to join this webinar. Always nice to see some familiar names in the in the chat and, and online. Uh, thanks for the presentation from Stardog. Really, really helpful. So uh, for, for folks that um, 
are new to this webinar, this is a monthly series uh, that we have been doing for several years now and we'll do again in 2023. Um, so uh, often is a question uh, right at the beginning that I'm sure uh, Shannon has been answering. Yeah, will this be recorded? Absolutely. And the nice thing about data diversity is all the previous topics um, are recorded. Um, and available, I think, in perpetuity. So um, if you missed any of the other topics uh, earlier this year, we'll be touching on some of those like master data management and data quality as we talk about graph because they are all interrelated. Uh, so do take advantage of that. Um, in next month will be enterprise architecture and its relationship into data architecture. And then pretty soon we'll be publishing next year's lineup as well. So hopefully you can join us there. Um, but what we are talking about today, and that was a great introduction to kind of the topic and in ways you folks can get hands on. Um, but yeah, yeah, to follow on from what Naveen was saying is that, you know, graph databases are cool <laughs> because they do allow you to kind of quickly have that idea of an enterprise knowledge graph. We'll kind of talk about what that is. I, understanding those key relationships between these different enterprise data sets. You know, you probably are, are using graph databases more often than you realize as a user um, and things like recommendation engine, social networks, you know, they are kind of the driver of a lot of things we're, we're kind of getting more used to. So we'll kind of go uh, over what they are and how they can use and also what they're not right within a new technology. Um, there's always that, uh, you know, a penchant to sort of say, you know, we can do this for everything and, and, and tools are good for individual things. So I think a lot of folks that, that frequent this webinar tend to be sort of from that relational database background, which is, you know, as we've talked about in previous uh, webinars, there's still like 90% of the market, if not more. So there's nothing wrong with that, but there's um, also new tools. So so hopefully for folks that have kind of grown up or live um, and doing a lot of work with that relational model, this presents kind of an, an alternative um, or, or augmenting of that relational model. So the way I like to think about it, you might say, what the heck is this? Um, but with graph databases, the way I think of it, because there's so many different database models or data approaches, when I kind of, I almost have a mnemonic for each, each type. And for me, graph is sort of that thing relates to thing. And if you're familiar with the, the cartoons there from Dr. Seuss, um, but what does that really mean? I guess the fancy way might be sort of nodes and, and just edges or vertices and relationships or whatever, but literally it is kind of like your entity relationship diagram, um, tables and, and relationships between tables, but we'll talk more about that um, of how the relationships between data really help that you know there was a question in the chat about what that we mean by that semantic layer uh, that really is is sort of it and and to get a little bit philosophical in this um presentation because uh you know a lot of this is is sort of the the the, the kind of the concepts of what we're even trying to do with each type of database storage. But one of the things that's nice about a graph database, at least in my odd brain, is it sort of mirrors the way we tend to think. You know, we don't always think literally. I know I don't. So you might say, you know, so I'm going to go visit Mary. And then you think, oh, Mary has a brother. And how does her brother doing? And is he still dating Stephanie? And he crashed that boat years ago. And boats are great. And then I like my boats. And then you know, if you're me, it's like squirrel. You know, but but things aren't linear when you're when you're distracted, that's a negative and it's sort of that squirrel. Um, but the beauty of the human brain is that we do make those connections, right? Because there's these interrelationship patterns. And what's the difference here? You have data, right? A boat is data, a squirrel is data, and, and brother and family relationships. But the difference here is those relationships between things, if that makes any sense. Um, and that's what's nice about graph because um as was mentioned in the intro, we don't always know those rules up front. Um, and a lot of it is the discovering those patterns and overlaying different patterns on the data or that semantic layer. I mean, one relationship here is those familial family relationships that Mary has a brother named John, right? The other is might be, you know, favorite hobbies. They like to ride boats and all the things around boats, right? The, the data is the same. They're still Mary and they're still a boat, uh, but those relationships between them is sort of what's different, if, if that makes any sense, right? The way I like to think of it, I guess getting philosophical, um, there's different ways of looking at the world. And, and this to me is almost more that relational database world, right? In the, you know, 1735, if you all of you folks had to re you know, memorize this in school, um, kind of that idea of hierarchies or taxonomies, um, you know, the um, you know, kind of memorizing the way we could create uh, ways to group biological systems. And we, I know I had to met, what was it, third grade or whatever, kingdom phylum, class order, family, genus, species, right? And the idea back then was that if we could just put everything in the world in its box, we can understand the world. And wouldn't that be nice? Everything seems so simple. Um, but sort of as we learn more about the world and the world gets more complex, 
the kind of different theories kind of around that or things like even chaos theory, all right? If you think of this idea of emergence, um, where, and if you follow this, but in complex systems, uh, sort of patterns arise out of the multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. And that's kind of the, the Wikipedia approach. Maybe, maybe a way of thinking of that is, you know, without getting religious or philosophical, there's this idea of a snowflake and there's certain patterns of snowflakes that sort of, you could see all of those things in the lower left are snowflakes, but no one top down uh, designed each snowflake and each one is different. There's no sort of pattern of snowflakeness that is the same. Where this theory is used is often um, a city planning, where I'm just thinking of my university where everything was built in very ordered squares and, and, and you know, the, there was, everything was right angles. And when people wanted to go to the library, they'd cut across that lawn because that was the fastest way. With sitting planning, they often look at those patterns of traffic music mo movement and build roads based off that. So to me, and you might be wondering, what on earth are you getting at here, Donna? To me, that's sort of the difference between um, that relationship model, um, a relational database where it's still very valid. I know I'm going to create a customer database with these fields. It's a customer can have more than one order and we link customers to orders through keys and we've designed that. Absolutely still a place for that. There are things and there are business rules in your organization that you must manage just like uh, kingdom phylum class order family genus species hasn't gone anywhere. That's still very helpful. We have the periodic table of elements that that model is still valid. And there's this new way of avoidance. I might not know how all of my customers fit together. Are they families? Do they have similar buying patterns? Are they committing fraud together? <laughs> right? And that's that new, that flexible thing that an enterprise knowledge graph can with that more that discovery or that emergence or discovering patterns in the data through those kind of first order relationships. If that makes any sense. I'm sort of feeling like I'm getting awfully philosophical, but I think that is a really a different way of looking at data that's different than that relational database world. And, and I agree um, from the beginning, you know, ETL isn't going away, um, but there's also things we can add to that um, for different discovery patterns. So in a graph database, it is more all about the relationships and their first order constraints. That's kind of your semantic layer, right? And kind of ironically, in a way, I'm, I'm going to quote, many of you may know um, Karen Lopez, you know, she's like a relational database isn't about relationships, it's about constraints, really. And we call it relational database, um, but it's really about doing keys, you know, a key that links a customer to an account. Um, also, when you think of key value pairs, that's not super, you know, that, that's not really what they are, are great at, but at a graph database, you know, a, a customer is the owner of an account and kind of those verb phrases are sort of what it's all about. Um, a, a, you know, we could have Mary and her, her bro brother. Mary is a brother of John or Mary is the boss of John or Mary, you know, is the enemy of John. Right? All of those relationships are really key to linking your graph databases together. And that's kind of what makes the graph uh, so powerful. Um, so, and, and again, I'm not going to get super technical here. The, the vendors, you know, as, as uh, Stardog mentioned, you know, download it, try it for yourself. Lots of great training online, um, which th this webinar isn't going to uh, certainly not replace. Uh, but we're hopefully, you know, if this isn't in your 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 paradigm or, or your way of working, it could be an interesting addition. Again, it's not a cure all for everything. I want to be careful of every new technology isn't uh, the, the best fit for everything, but it is a very powerful tool if you're not looking at it in your in your company or in your way of working. It, it might be something you want to look at. So, what are some of the use cases? Um, social networks, right? We kind of we kind of hinted at that with Mary and her brother, right? So, understanding we have a bunch of people in our, in our database. You know, who are the cool kids in the database? People who are linked with Donna because they go on webinars and they talk about data. There's a few sad, lonely people up in the corner who don't like data and they are not in my network because why would I have them in my network, right? But that that is used all the time. Think of Facebook and a lot of that, right? How do we think of patterns or customer buying patterns? Um, you know, what, what are our patterns or what are, uh, think of it in insecurity and risk. There's a terrorist and who are those people linked with that maybe bad actor, right? So this idea of that social network approach, which is all about the relationships is a really neat use case for sort of graph and that graph model. Um, maybe this I'm getting all over the map in this presentation, but we were sort of used to that concept. If you remember, maybe it's the old folks in the call, the bacon number, right? What's your, how many degrees of separation are you from Kevin Bacon? Um, and, um, 
you know, the, the, I, I, there's actually a website out there where you can kind of, uh, it's called the Oracle of Bacon, where you can actually see your bacon number and how far away you are from Kevin Bacon. Um, so here, for example, uh, Audrey Hepburn, famous act, actress, uh, done a lot of great movies. Um, you can say, okay, what's the, what's the bacon number for Audrey Hepburn? Um, you'll see right away, there's a bit of a problem. Um, there's two Audrey Hepburns, right? There's, there's more than one actress with the name Audrey Hepburn. So which uh, Hepburn are we talking about, right? So it kind of proves the point that data quality, master data management, metadata management are still important. These graphs can be super helpful, but if you have the wrong name for Audrey Hepburn or can't can't kind of you know differentiate who's, I mean, the, the power of the graph is you can kind of figure that out. Oh, they're both in different movies, uh, right? <laughs> um, you know, and, and that sort of thing. But it, you know, you can't have these great powerful graphs when you don't have great data as the basis, right? But kind of maybe a fun example uh, to kind of show both the power, but also kind of some of the risks. Um, moving along, um, fraud detection, I kind of mentioned that. So uh, think of that in terms of if you have online transactions, there, there's typically, you know, identifiers that, you know, I logged in, um, at it with a certain user ID, certain IP address, geolocation, credit card, et cetera. Um, graph patterns can kind of help you detect some of that fraud, right? So I have one IP address that just suddenly had 17 or here, seven in this example, credit card transactions all within a few minutes. Seems a little strange. <laughs> Is that a bot? Is that someone, you know, committing fraud? It doesn't mean that every IP address that is more than one, the one on the right just must be three people in the same family. They're all shopping for Christmas at the same time. Or the one next to that could be me with both my personal and my business credit card buying a couple things near each other. Those might not flag anything weird, but when you start to see massive, these kind of tightly knit, you know, graphs or kind of indicators of maybe we should take a deeper look into this, right? Um, so companies can kind of put some uh, triggers into place. To say, hey, you know, when this happens, let, let's maybe do something about it. Um, recommendation engines, you know, we're all sort of familiar with those. I bought this, you know, would you like to also buy this when you're doing online shopping? That can be powered by a graph database, right? Because, you know, th this customer bought this product that does as a graph relationship to another product, super powerful. Um, you know, again, very different from maybe how you might use a relational database in terms of that. Um, a power, but that's um, that definitely uh, an interesting use case. As with everything, though, <laughs> there are, you know, it, it isn't a silver bullet. You need good data quality. You also need good data volume. So this was an example I was kind of going through uh, and did, uh, you know, I was on amazon.com and then just picked something strange, uh, an axe on the, on the left, which actually followed me around on the internet because they thought I wanted to buy axes and it was sort of creepy uh, for several weeks, different topic. Um, but the recommendation engine I got was, you know, people who purchased this axe also bought coffee filters, which is a very strange recommendation. It's really hard to see why on earth, if I'm buying an axe, to either split wood or kill people or whatever I do with it, why would that have any relationship to coffee filters, right? Probably my guess is that that type of axe is used for camping. Um, and those uh, coffee filters are kind of some of the ones that people use when they go camping and, and, and kind of use that. So, you know, maybe three people up in, in Alaska or Canada were kind of going camping and, and bought these and, and there wasn't enough of a data set to really have a great recommendation of here's other three kinds of camping axes that people might have bought or or a sharpener for that camping axe or something, right? Uh, so in this case, the, the model is fine. There's nothing wrong with the graph pattern, but the data set itself was flawed. Um, so something to think about that of, of you know, volume, both the data quality um, or the being able to have that master data, those, those nodes uh, be correct but also having F volume to have this make sense, uh, which leads me to master data management um, because uh, I, I have whole rants about master data management. Often folks kind of talk about that 360 view or really understanding all of that. That's not master data. Master data you know, enables that. Master data is which Audrey Hepburn and I are talking about. Do we have her right name and do we have her right address, right? Which enables the 360 view of all the great things about Audrey Hepburn, um, but is not master data. So. Um, this idea of a graph database is used in some of these solutions around master data management, uh, but I just want to be a little careful that there's different ways to approach master data management. Uh, refer you to the master data webinar we gave earlier this year, and there's a lot of, a lot of great um, resources on master data management. You have different models. A one, one model is, is kind of, let's go for that centralized approach. That typically is your relational database model. Um, say I want that hub, and I want all my 
customers in the same place and I wanna create my matching rules, it's the same customer if they have the same name and the same birthday and the same I don't know, social insurance or social security number, right? Uh, that is pretty important to get that right node so if we're going to say push back to your operational systems right right once i've i have identified the correct audrey Hepburn or, or donna burbank i'm going to then go push back to all the systems once donna changed her address and make sure all the systems are synced you really want to get those matching rules and really get that you know down um but often kind of that idea that was touched on in the intro you know that virtualized approach or maybe more the analytical you know I, I i'm not necessarily pushing back to all the source systems if i if i, I I'm, I'm just trying to see buying patterns of wealthy people and i want to know you know who audrey hepburn is related to um so we can target her friends to buy jewelry or whatever the rich people buy um and, and then you kind of want that that flexibility and it's fine to have um that kind of virtualized layer across and it's more of that discovery approach i've seen customers kind of use both really well together of let's use something like a graph or, or that virtualization type approach to do discovery and see those patterns and even see you know who are our top customers what are they purchasing how do they link together um which kind of helps define some of those business rule patterns and then they also went to more of that kind of relational mode of the you know the match rules and the match merge sync for the MDM. Uh, so they, they, I'm not going to say one is right, one is wrong. They both have their um, their benefits. Um, but you know that MDM of trying to do those match merge. How do you discover who's the who's the right Aubrey Hepburn? That's kind of the hardest stuff <laughs> that you have to get right before you want to get all of the benefits. It doesn't stop you from doing a graph. They can again, it's it's a cycle. You can do the graph to do the discovery that might help you with some of the data quality, which is then going to enhance your graph. So it doesn't mean you have to get everything perfect before you start a graph. You know, on the contrary, they can kind of um be synergistic and, and help each other. Um, so, so kind of, you know, in, in the title of this webinar, we, we didn't want to just only sing the praises of graphics, so the benefits and risks. I think one of the risks that I touched on in the beginning is, you know, what's that phrase when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so um, data warehousing is, is, is something that's been around for a very long time. Um, it's still a very valuable thing. It's not a graph. They have different use cases. So data warehouses are still around. They're not going anywhere. They're not the only tool in the toolkit. Uh, but if you are trying to aggregate and summarize data, probably wouldn't use a graph database. Your classic, you know, I want to report on product by sales, by region, by sales rep, by whatever you're sort of describing a, a data warehouse. Um, so that's a very kind of different approach and they can work really well together for different use cases. You know, I want to get my total sales by region, by customer each month in 2017. You know, I think most folks in this call are kind of familiar with that approach that's sort of almost where data diversity type <laughs> webinars grew up and, and started and in, in the day because we've been around for a long time how do i understand the source systems get the data quality from the source systems do that etl model it either relationally or dimensionally and then start to you know create your cubes and do the slicing and dicing do we even know how to calculate total sales you know what do we mean by a region what's a customer is it fiscal month or you know uh, calendar month all of that is still super valid and maybe I also want to add on a knowledge graph of who might be my most influential customers with the most connections. You know, Audrey Hepburn bought a fancy watch. Now, all her friends, I know she's not alive anymore, but all her friends um, would be buying that uh, same watch. Um, so maybe those are the folks I want to target or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's really a different approach and, and a really powerful approach um, to work together. So de definitely something to consider. Um, this might be another odd, odd thing, <laughs> um, but I think data management and, and, and ballroom dancing, what on earth is she talking about here? Um, so I, I, I tried ballroom dancing a long time ago, and, and it's kind of what the teacher had said there was, you know, first, when you're just beginning dancing, uh, you dance with yourself. You're just standing at, at your, looking at your feet, so you're not going to step across and, and step on your partner. That's probably still where I am. And then when it kind of clicks, um, and maybe I've had a few moments of this, and you and your your partner are just kind of in sync, and the, you know you don't see the rest of the war room, and you're just spinning around. It's super graceful. 
then when you're really good, um, I think I had this once in my life. I got kind of knew what the person was talking about. Everyone is such a good dancer and they're all in sync and you feel like the whole room is kind of connecting and, and the music and it, you're, that's really where kind of that progression of data management, again, first you dance with yourself, don't step on anyone, then you dance with your partner and then you're really, and to me, that's sort of a graph database. Maybe I'm the only person <laughs> who would have put those together. But again, you want to get your data quality right. I want to make sure it's the right Aubrey Hepburn or Donna Burbank's birthday is correct. So you can all send me gifts. Um, but then once you get that and then you can add things like the graph, that's when you're starting to make those connections and really dance with the room, right? Because there is so much data um, in these, these various silos in different areas across the room. You, you, the more you can unlock that and do that idea of the enterprise knowledge graph, that's really getting to that next level where you're not hindered by having to go, you know, step by step or link everything together with ETL. Maybe that didn't make sense, but it sort of did to me in the thing of, you know, that opportunity of really getting that graph approach is that kind of enterprise dancing with the room. Um, so again, it can um, present this holistic view of the organization through these relationships. So again, you can discover things. This might be, say, a um, high net worth insurance company that insures people like an Audrey Hepburn for her, you know, her mansion in France versus her mansion in Aspen and her yacht and her, you know, she filed the claim because her, her windows on her yacht broke or something like that. Um, and you probably really want to understand that customer, what, you know, what assets they do own, who they're related to, all of that sort of those graph um, patterns. And this might be something you discovered that Audrey Hepburn, you know, maybe I have a customer called Luca Dotti, which was born in 1970, who's her son. Um, and you might not have realized that without some of these, these graph patterns or, you know, really, again, that's the, it's hard enough to get the right claims and the right dates of birth and all of that. But really it's those, those linkages or that, that power of the graph um, that can really help with some of that. So hopefully that made sense as well. Um, I thought this would be helpful. Um, if many of you know who have joined these webinars, um, we do uh, global data strategy and data diversity do a survey. It's been like five years now that we do this every year, sort of trends in data management of who's using graph databases. Unfortunately or fortunately, the, the fact is uh, they're, they're sort of lower level of adoption than some of the others. As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, number one in, on the planet is still the good old fashioned relational database. Don't think that is going anywhere. Um, what keeps me up at night is number two is spreadsheets. So please stop doing that. Nothing wrong with a spreadsheet, but really is not an enterprise data management tool. So again, whether it's relational or on-prem kind of re um, relational, what did I say? On-prem or cloud uh, relational still kind of leads the, the way. Um, but I, I think the idea, one of the things I, I find interesting about this graph is the number of other options. And again, it's not an either or, it's an and. So yes, you may be using an on-prem or cloud-based uh, relational database. Doesn't mean you need to stop, but what can you use to augment that? Um, in a graph database, you know, back again to the beginning, you may have these silos of relational databases or data warehouses um, and kind of having that graph pattern to go across that and really create that enterprise knowledge graph, the, the dancing with the room um, can really be helpful. So, but unfortunately right now it's only about, I guess almost 14% According to this, this is kind of the data diversity crowd um, are, are using graph databases today. So looking ahead and, and maybe kind of going into what people are, are looking at is definitely growing. Um, so you'll see it jumped up much higher. Um, so back to the top, you know, relational is still the top. I think more folks are looking to the cloud than on-prem. So that matches my experience, but you'll see graph database has jumped and over 21% of folks are looking at that. So I'd be kind of curious, anyone here on the call who, who might um, be, so, or getting kind of some, some thoughts on that in the discussion, which I know folks are never shy. Um, and so interesting to hear kind of people's um, experience there. I, I find what's sort of interesting here, spreadsheets did go down in the group. I think that's just because people, no one wants to admit that their go forward strategy is spreadsheets, but some folks were honored, honest here. Um, but yeah, definitely not the not the thing we, we want to see. Um, okay, so in, in summary, and we did kind of leave some good time for questions. I guess I spoke even faster than I normally do. Um, but again, what's, what's graph? Again, with all the different things you need to keep in your very busy brain, how do I think of a graph? I often think it's that thing relates to thing. And the idea of that semantics or the relationships are kind of first class 
constructs in a graph database. Um, some really interesting use cases for graph. We talked about a few of the idea of that, that social network is, is kind of a, an easy one to think of in your brain because it is that thing related to thing or customer related to customer fraud detection recommendation you know that that really that enterprise knowledge graph of linking everything together um and yeah not as many people are using it now i would say um get your hands on it folks like um stardog you know they're offering some free free stuff out there just to play around there's no risk i think you know if you're like me it, it's nice to kind of know in, in webinars like this what's out there what the possibilities are but it doesn't quite click until you've actually done it yourself and gotten your hands dirty so i would take the vendors up uh, whether it's Stardog or, or anyone else that kind of offers either these the more detailed training. You know, again, this wasn't the how-to of how to build a graph. It was more the the why to. <laughs> um, so again, I take up the vendor and, and they'll be on the Q&A as well um, for that. So um, do want to give a bit of a plug. Uh, again, everything in the past was on on uh, uh, on our, this will be recorded if you want to catch it again. Next month is on enterprise architecture if you want to kind of join us for that. Uh, totally blatant plug. If any of this is of interest for you, we do this for a living. <laughs> Don't hesitate to contact us at Global Data Strategy. Um, and then without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Shannon to open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Shannon, are you there? Is it just me who's not hearing it? I'm here, Donna. This is Naveen. Hmm. Is Shannon still on? Shannon hmm. may be anticipating uh, you finishing a little later than you. Uh, maybe that. Yeah, I did oh. talk a whole, whole fast. Um, I will read them off then. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, I hope I get permission from, from Shannon on that later. So the first one is, you know, is the knowledge graph uh, used or suited for referential metadata um, more than for statistical time series? Uh, data. So I'll, I'll pass that to you, Naveen, first. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, we we talk about this sort of in the context of um, knowledge graph being a database, uh, but really this knowledge graph is graph-based technology. Uh, so the modeling, the semantic modeling is graph-oriented. But the data does not have to be materialized necessarily in inside of the the storage layer of knowledge graph. Uh, one of the benefits of an enterprise knowledge graph platform is you can leave data in place. So typically, what we see clients with that that kind of collect time series data tend to do those in one of their preferred big data platforms and pull time series data in as sort of almost like a virtual access virtualized access and connect that up with other meaningful business concepts that helps them derive some useful insight. So no, yes, no. While, while from a materialization standpoint, it's better suited for referential or metadata uh, or, or even unstructured text-based you know, entities that you're extracting using NLP pipelines. Um, the, the approach people take with time series data is not to necessarily push everything into the materialized view of a knowledge graph, but the, the benefit of having a virtualized access is that you can pull in the relevant time series data to answer a specific question that's connected with other ideas or concepts uh, within the knowledge graph. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I do think that benefit of the knowledge graph is that referential aspect of it. And yes, statistical data could be an input, but I, yeah, I think if there's better ways to store raw time series for what you're trying to do. But yeah, the knowledge graph is that layer above it that helps you do that connection. So I, I think Shannon is, Back. I am back. Um, sorry I'm about so sorry. that. I yeah. talked really fast today, I guess. <laughs> no worries. And, and I was just having issues. You know, it's, you know, one of those days. So. <laughs> it is one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, diving in. Um, and uh, so th can you share um, more about success stories using graph databases? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll start and then I'll definitely pass it over. Um, um, I, I've seen more and more in terms of, we, I gave some, and I'm not sure when this, this question came in, um, some of the examples. I, I'm seeing kind of um, pharmaceutical uh, doing, making a lot of use of 
graph in, in that, again, what, what is pharma? It's kind of about some of that discovery. And there's just a lot, a, a lot of volume of data. And you don't necessarily know the answer before you kind of go out. So I, I think in terms of industries looking at that, I know that's one that I've seen um, a lot of, of folks kind of using this idea of the power of the graph. But um, I'll pass it back to Star Dog and see, see if you guys have any that you want to share. Well, absolutely. Yes, yeah. so we see uh, the application of knowledge graphs through, for a whole host of industry use cases, um, everything from life sciences pharma, which you mentioned around uh, clinical, preclinical R&D to, you know, all, all the way to the commercializations. We call it sort of a molecule to market uh, as part of drug discovery, where you're even looking at it from a safety recall perspective, research perspective. Uh, understanding the interactions between compounds and molecules uh, and proteins and the makeup uh, of the the particular drug uh, interaction with other drugs, right? So, so that's a, it's a great primary use case with with large large pharmaceuticals. We also see this in the context of financial services, working around operational risk, um, uh, IT asset management use cases, customer three hundred and sixty. And and uh, manufacturing is another big industry uh, that. Uh, that's looking at implementing knowledge graphs for things like um, digital twin, digital thread for supply chain, uh, product 360, bill of materials, or uh, again, stop ship from a, from a you know, safety recall perspective, uh, understanding that we also see this in terms of models-based system engineering, NASA, big client of ours, or, or you know, they're, we're part of their uh, moon, moon rocket launch. Um, the same thing with the Raytheon, you know, working on the F-35 understanding the entire supply chain of the the parts and the components that make up uh and the quality associated with the the, the components that make up the, the the fighter jet so yeah i wanted to add one more thing as you were talking it was getting my uh, brain going i mean i found it interesting you know we 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 do consulting for a living and one of the reasons we started looking more at graph often was at customers that were sort of saying hey i was at company x and we tried a graph and one of the things, you know, in addition to the use cases that uh, we both mentioned was kind of that speed to market. Um, and again, it's not everything. So, you, know, you, you still have to do the data quality and all of that. But in terms of, you know, whether it's a POC or something that goes into production, I think that is the power of this discovery way of discovery is that just in terms of time to getting some of this insight, um, there's been really some positive feedback on that approach. So something to think oh, about. Absolutely. Not often I jump around and change the order of the questions, but this question I think is very much related to the current the question that you were just talking about. You know, what are the most common use cases for using graph databases, and especially for uh, an industry like government? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we touched on some of the, the the common use cases. You know, the pharma, the the pat. You know, when you're thinking of you're trying to discover uh, patterns. Um, uh, fraud detection is one that was mentioned for financial services. I think in terms of um, which area of government one is understanding citizen and citizen relationships. I think in terms of federal government, I, you know, some sort of bad actor threat detection in terms of terrorism and things like that is a, a use of, of uh, you know, graph because you're trying to understand some of the patterns. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it over to Stardog and, and what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, and uh, in terms of government, certainly the ones you highlighted, uh, model model based system engineering is is certainly big. Um, as I talked about the NASA and the Raytheon use cases, uh, we also see um, cybersecurity as another use case, both in in the government sector as well as um, as well as uh, financial services. Uh, again, detecting patterns. Right, um, you look at uh, you know more on the the health side of the the government sector. Uh, you, you know, you do see things like fraud come up quite a bit or or just tracking patient data from a citizen use perspective. Um, it, integrated criminal justice is another use case we, we see quite often. Um, so again, depending on the part of the sector of the government, civilian defense, uh, intelligence, uh, you, you'll see different applications. Ultimately, you kind of think about this from the standpoint of, your, so you're doing this sort of wide data connectivity, right? So you have data in silos and how do you bring it together and present it in a way that's meaningful to someone that has to take certain action or decisions, right? And and, and the best way to enable that is through this, you know, this creation of the semantic model that ties the underlying data together against this model that's abstracted away from the underlying data infrastructure. Yeah. 
With regard to what appears to be a low use of graph databases, any thoughts on why this is the case and should it increase? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'm super interested in, in what Jardog has to say. Um, you know, I also, this was a, a survey from data diversity. Again, I think a lot of us at data diversity kind of grew up in that relational world and are probably busy enough with that. I, I think as with any technology, I've found that in certain industries, it's, it is much more common and I think it will start to, to play out. Um, you know, again, uh, I've, I've seen similar pharma. There's a lot financial services. There's a lot. Good, good point. Um, got aerospace engineering. We've got a few customers from there that are super um, interested in or, or have already implemented graph. So I think it will grow over time. It's it's also just you know um, there are certain use cases where it's good for uh, certain where it's not. Another area I've seen it. I mean, the other thing is I think you know I wouldn't be surprised if people not folks who are building it, but maybe using it without realizing it. Uh, some of the master data management solutions or this idea of customer 360 in terms of vendors um, that are providing kind of pre-built solutions are using graph behind the scenes. So it might be a case also that it's more ubiquitous than folks realize they may be, um, you know, not the folks building it if they're on a, on a data diversity survey, but they it's certainly kind of embedded in other things. But, um, but back to you, maybe and see what you think. Yeah, I mean, certainly look, the, the... The uh, application of graph knowledge graphs in general has has really skyrocketed over the last few years. I mean, Gartner says that eighty percent of all data and analytics uh, innovation will have a knowledge graph component to it by twenty twenty five. You know, which is you know within the one to two year range that you described earlier, Donna. Um, more importantly, we're now seeing new uh, patterns emerge from a reference architecture. If you if you if you're following the whole data fabric versus data mesh. A reference architecture discussion that has a knowledge graph component to it, uh, primarily for the reason that you know you want to create some ability to create these knowledge-centric domains in a decentralized fashion that makes data as a product, uh, but then be able to combine that across domains as well, so that you can answer more critical business questions in certain in certain areas where there is a demand to connect across domains as well, right? So data fabric architectures, data mesh architectures are, are beginning to uh, be deployed with a knowledge graph semantic layer uh, underpinning. Once the knowledge graph is established, how do you add new information? Aren't there refactoring issues? I mean, absolutely. It's not a static, just as you know, any other sort of analytics isn't isn't static. So you want to, you know, keep refactoring over time and keep adding. And, and you know, I, I like that um, reference to the kind of the data, data mesh and data fabric. You know, that that is the beauty of these is they are are dynamic. Um, but I'll pass that back to Stardog in terms of your approach to to keeping things fresh. Yeah, keeping things fresh. Look again, it's it's now. I know we the title says graph database, and and one of the things we really push this notion that it's you don't have to materialize everything into a knowledge mm -hmm. graph. And if you do have to do that, that's fine. You know, you still employ things like change data capture and triggers to push new information rights to to the knowledge graph. But the approach we find that's that's that works best for a lot of organizations is leaving data in place, right? So you kind of limit the amount of data sprawl. And at the query time, because you've created this mapping to a virtualized source wherever the data lives, you're actually bringing the data together at query time, so you, you're doing it. You're doing the integration at compute time rather than in a storage layer, right? So, so that way you always have access to the freshest data uh, in, in terms of uh, you know the queries that, that that you execute and when you execute them. I'm using a graph database for business reporting lineage. Any suggestions? I'm sorry. Could you read that one again? I'm using a graph database for a business reporting lineage. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, that's an interesting because that's definitely the thing that relates to thing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's an interesting use case. Um, Stardog, what do, what do you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. We're we're seeing uh, increased utilization of um, a knowledge graph platform to to support lineage types of reporting and applications inside the enterprise. Um, in fact, <clears throat> many organizations have invested in a data catalog somewhere in the organization. And sometimes that's the basis of, uh, you know, sucking in metadata about data 
um, you know, whether it's a Calibra or, or Unity catalog from Databricks or Alation or Purview from Microsoft, right, uh, or even Glue from AWS. So that's a great way to, to pull in a lot of the metadata associated with information inside the enterprise about the data. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is connect the metadata to the actual data so you make it more queryable and you tie it to a more abstracted view of the information that has business meaning and representation to people that want to ask the question, right? So data scientists can ask from a lineage perspective, what's the source of the data? Can I trust it? Um, uh, these are citizen data users, I'm sorry, can ask those questions. Uh, data scientists can even do, leverage that to say, I'm looking to you know, do some feature engineering around a particular machine learning model and I need some geospatial data. Where in my enterprise data landscape can I find that information, right? So being able to use that as that sort of knowledge catalog that sits on top of your source systems or on top of your existing data catalog is a great use case. Yeah, and you bring a good point. And I think that was touched on in the initial question as well, is that metadata connections and metadata is data at the end of the day, right? So, you know, there's that whole meta level of using the graph as well as linking it to the data. So, so many use cases, it's pretty exciting stuff. What so, else is on the list, Shannon? Yeah, we, I think we could spend a whole, probably a whole year talking about this <laughs> next question, but it's certainly a webinar. Um, based on your experience, to what degree is maintaining consistency of data a challenge? And would you elaborate? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on it first. And I kind of touched on it in, in the webinar. And you're right, this is probably a series of, you know, of, of webinars. Uh, just because, well, probably even more so because you can link all of the data together. Uh, that data has to be of good quality, right? If I'm linking, you know, customers together or interactions together, you know, th that only works well when you have a good data. Do you, have, again, as I mentioned before, do you have to wait and get that benefit? It, it is a cycle. You can discover a whole lot of patterns that may help you understand more about the data, which can lead to more discovery to help you, you know, in, in implement that data quality or, you know, the interaction. But I, I think having visibility is a great first step. So I think data quality is an evolution. You definitely want to, you know, work on that. Um, but back to Naveen's point as well, it, it is, isn't necessarily that everything has to be in the same place, all in one big database um, to be consistent. That idea of kind of that, you know, graph approach where we're adding this, you know, virtualized, if you want to say, you know, layer on top of it can help with that consistency. But that I feel like I'm talking in circles, but it doesn't obviate the need to, to really have that data quality. So, you know, it is a bit of both of you. You still need to work on the data quality. Those nodes, the, the data you're linking, if it doesn't make sense, you're not going to get much from the graph. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to stop everything and put it in one centralized place to start getting that value. So, you know, th there's still a place for that in some cases, but I think they can play nicely in with each other. Um, but but curious what Stardog wants to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I see this question two ways. One is sort of this common, the semantic and at a modeling level, right? This sort of how do you get alignment and agreement on you know, a customer means a customer and then borrow the semantic technology and say, you don't have to have, have the same definition. You can actually have have a semantic relationship to the idea that a customer can be someone else, you know, can be a, a, a supplier, uh, a customer can be, um, uh, you know, maybe a, a partner. And, and that definition has that semantic relationship because they're all kind of type type of people uh and then that definition can also be segregated by different or different parts of the organization and you can have multiple lenses looking at that information in the context of their way and their definition right so there's consistency at that level and in terms of consistency of the underlying data itself you know i think that's a function of a bit of uh, quality, a bit of uh, defining the data quality constraints associated with the data itself. Uh, those can be again tied to the semantic model. They don't. You don't have to do this in mass uh, without any context, right? Uh, data has to be fit for purpose. Consistency of data, uh, you know, in a vacuum, you really don't know what to do. What what consistency means? So defining it in, in sort of in terms of uh, what is fit for purpose for a given use. And enforcing that through these data quality constraints is something a knowledge graph can enforce as well. So, 
Yeah, that's a great, great point. I mean, we often say, you know, the definition of data quality is fit for purpose. You know, there's no necessarily right or wrong. So that ability in a graph to add those different semantic layers of what might be right in the context of one relationship may may not be so much in the other, right? So yeah, that's a great point um, of kind of really being able to hone in on those different use cases is super important. How does Stardog mm -hmm. facilitate one's ability to writing graph queries? Yeah, so uh, we have a, um, because we emphasize this notion of citizen data user participation, we are, are one of our applications called Explorer has this ability to allow users, citizen data users to create uh, graph queries visually. So like a visual design experience of a query that doesn't require any knowledge of the underlying standard called Sparkle. Um, so that's certainly one way we facilitate writing graph queries. Um, Alternatively, uh, we obviously have an IDE. So if you are uh, more of uh, an advanced user and want to write your own Sparkle queries, uh, we have an IDE and a workspace you can kind of write right away and create, create as many graph queries as you want. And I think we have time for a couple more questions here. We got about five minutes. So what's the biggest challenge in implementing a successful graph? Hmm. I'll get, I'll get Starbucks opinion on that first. You want to take that one? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, biggest challenge in implementing a successful graph. Uh, I think it's, it's um, oftentimes the, 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 the first set of conversations we have is, you know, the uh, companies or users are trying to um, boil the ocean Um and trying to come up with this perfect semantic data model description uh, that will help facilitate all the information that a business needs. And they get mired in terms of, you know, the typical blocking and tackling, you know, what's a common definition for me? What does it really mean? Um, uh, you know, sometimes you get too wire mired into the, the, the standards to the point where you're defining entities and concepts that really have no meaning for the business, but you're doing it because you're a purist in terms of your approach. Uh, uh, you know, like, like everything you just said, everything's a thing. Well, so let's start with a thing class and thing can also be people and thing can also be objects and thinking, you know, it has no relevance to financial services and the use case around, you know, IT asset management. So don't always think about this from a purest sense of approaching, uh, uh, you know, your journey on, on our knowledge graphs, right? Just start with uh, your your minimalist, set, you know, as, aspects of of entities and relationships that are needed in order to answer a question, and then you kind of build build from there, right? You can always add new classes, and you, not every class has to be mapped to the source, so you can have classes with no instances of data. That's fine. You can add them over time. You can add the mapping over time. Uh, but focus on on a given use case, uh, and 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 that will definitely yield the results that creates value for the business in short order, uh, and eventually an implementation that's successful for the enterprise. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree that starting small. I guess I mean, one of my thoughts, too, especially for you know a lot of folks that grew up in a relational world, it, it is a different way of of thinking, um, and to kind of start with a. a I mean, I've had. A lot of my clients have a lot of great experience with, again, that time to market and some value, but it it often seems like a new, it's too big of a new thing to start with all the other things we've had, um, but maybe starting smaller. Or, or I think the learning, and I'm going to say the learning curve is difficult, but the impression that it's yet another new thing to learn, I think stops a few folks. But, you know, again, starting with the small use case is a great idea because I think it's a great thing to have in the toolkit. Um, yeah, and that shouldn't stop anyone because I, I I was I was a little surprised at the low adoption as well because they are super powerful. And probably something to add to your list this year of things to kind of explore. Right. Yeah. Uh, trying to debate. So okay, can I slip in one more question? We've got less than two <laughs> minutes here. <laughs> um, how are controls built around ARCs within a graph database in family relationships, like you described in some examples? If A is the mother of B, is it possible to parse through the graph in reverse and say B is the son and daughter of A? What additional logic considerations are needed to formulate those modified relationships? Yeah, no, I'll pass that to Stardog first too as well. 
Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, they, again, the, um, there there's the relationships you can infer. So not everything within a knowledge graph has to be codified in in a in the semantic model, right? In terms of relationships, so uh, you can you can have a relationship where it says A is the mother of B. Um, and then B perhaps has uh, you know a certain age, and if so, if A is a mother of B, then you can actually infer that B uh, at at a at query time you can infer the relationship between B and A as B being the son of A. So it doesn't have to be codified in terms of actually um, defining it in the model uh, in, uh, in, in sort of you know. Uh, explicitly, sorry, I was, I was thinking about the word. And so, so what that really means is at query time, the, there's a notion of inferencing or reasoning where you can apply a, a, on the graph where you can say if, if, a, if there's an A relationship, if A is mother of B, then you infer that B is the son of A and you can create that relationship on the fly at, queries, at query time. Great, yeah. Great, and I have nothing to add to that. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for this fantastic presentation, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today's webinar. Uh, thanks to Stardog for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. Thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged. Just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you. Appreciate Thank the you. time and the opportunity. So hopefully folks had a, have a good day. Thank you. Cheers.